Everyday women and men become legends Sins that go against our skin become blessings The movement is a rhythm to us Freedom is like religion to us Justice is juxtaposition in us Justice for all just ain't specific enough One son died, his spirit is revisiting us True My name is Calvin Samuel I'm Methodist Minister for the towns of Rochford and Rayleigh in the county of Essex I spent the last 25 years avoiding conversations about race. It was not a conversation I wanted to have for multiple reasons. I didn't want to fall into the stereotype of the black guy playing the race card to avoid the eye rolling which says it's always about race with you guys. I was also conscious that I didn't necessarily come to questions of race from the same background as many of my peers in the UK. I grew up in Antigua in the Caribbean. I didn't live with the kind of everyday racism that many of my peers who grew up in the UK may have had to live with. My teachers were nearly without exception black. The police were black. All of our prime ministers have been black. There I was not an ethnic minority constantly made to feel other by the wider society. So I never really had to learn to navigate the subtleties of racism or unconscious bias. So I realize I can be a bit tone deaf to subtle racism. And so I avoid this conversation. So why speak now? The murders of Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey and George Floyd in the United States and in such proximity of time simply reaffirmed that in the US at least black life was not sufficiently valued. But for me, the kicker was the story that surfaced a few weeks ago that two Metropolitan Police officers dispatched to the scene of a double homicide took selfies with the bodies of two murdered black women. The women, Bibar and Nicole, were daughters of Mina Smallman, former Archdeacon of South End, and the first black arch woman Archdeacon in the Church of England. This wasn't something in the US, and this wasn't long ago. This was here and now and in South End where my churches are and it happened to a clergy family like mine. This felt even more personal. And all this happened against a backdrop of a conversation the day before with a member of my church who felt offended because Black Lives Matter posters were on display in my living room whilst I was filming the online Sunday service. I spent the last 15 years working in areas of the country where there are very few people of color. In every role I've undertaken in the last 17 years, I've been the first black person ever to be appointed to that role. It means that most of my friends are white. I spend my time in spaces that are predominantly white and lack diversity. And this video is prepared with you, my friends, in mind. It feels like a long overdue and deeply uncomfortable conversation, not so much about race, but about racism. Some of this is going to be very obvious and will repeat things you already know. Some of it, I hope, might add some nuance to your understanding, and some of it, for some of you, will cause offence. And if it does, you might want to ask yourself why that is, and then by all means, please do come and talk to me. The first thing I want to say is that we do need to have this long overdue conversation about racism. Brits are very uncomfortable talking about race, never mind racism. And lots of people would like to believe in a world where racism exists only among the far right when the reality is that racism is found in all sorts of places, among all sorts of people, many of whom really should know better and indeed do know better, but the attitudes still can exist. And just because you don't see it does not mean it's not there. People of color can be deeply encouraged if you as a white person can simply acknowledge that racism, especially anti-blackness racism is a thing. And it's not just oversensitive black people overreacting or reading motives into a situation. Your words matter. One of the responses I've got from a lot of folks is, why is it black lives matter? Surely all lives matter. Well, of course you're right. All lives matter, or at least they should. The reality, however, is that too many parts of the world operate as though black lives matter less. The black, Asian and minority ethnic population in our youth offenders institutions is at 51%, despite making up only 18% of the 10 to 17 population. So unless you believe that young people of colour are three times more criminal than white young people, then the system is producing a wildly unfair result. 
you're four times as likely to be stopped by the police in London if you're black. So unless you believe black people to be four times as criminal as white people, then there is a problem with the system. It disadvantages one group more than others. I could go on. Saying Black Lives Matter is not to suggest that Black Lives Matter more than others, but simply to say that they shouldn't matter less. And that if it's true that all lives matter, then it should not be a problem to affirm that black lives matter. One of the unconscious problems we have in Britain is that of the normalization and assumed neutrality of whiteness, which is a social construct and itself a form of white privilege. Three weeks ago, the Conservatives posted an image of a father and son on social media wishing Happy Father's Day. The models used were black. Some of the responses to it have been telling. Some people are outraged that images of black people were used, given that they are not representative of the majority ethnicity of the country as a whole. Underneath that kind of complaint is an assertion of white normalization or normativity. Lots of people, including myself, are sometimes inclined to think of vanilla ice cream as plain ice cream, a sort of default setting for ice cream. It's a standard ice cream that goes with everything, as you know. Brownies, apple pie, sticky toffee pudding, lemon meringue pie, summer fruit crumble, whatever. If you want other ice cream flavours, chocolate, strawberry, caramel, rum and raisin, you simply add those flavours to plain ice cream. That's pretty much how it works when you buy an ice cream cone from an ice cream van, isn't it? The cone comes with vanilla and you can add your chocolate or cherry sauce with a flake, if you like. The reality, of course, is that vanilla ice cream is not plain ice cream. Vanilla is as much a flavour as strawberry, chocolate or rum and raisin. And it's a default, not because that's the way ice cream is. It's a default because we've chosen it to be so. And when people think of ice cream, quite often they think of vanilla as the norm and other flavours as variations from that norm. And that, my friend, is one way in which whiteness works. It assumes a normativity and neutrality and places everything else as a variation from the norm. And not only that, it sees other flavours as ice cream as having a flavour, whilst failing to notice that vanilla is itself a flavour. Instead, it positions and perceives itself as the norm. Ice cream as God intended. When people talk about white privilege, partly it's this idea that like vanilla, one can assume a certain normativity and a default setting. The assumption that this is what ice cream should be. A bit like thinking everyone else has an accent, but the way we speak is normal. Until white people as a whole recognise that your whiteness is actually a social construct, that the vanilla has been added, that ice cream doesn't simply come out of the vat with vanilla intrinsic to the process then it will never be possible to acknowledge the constant othering that people of colour have to navigate in this country. And that acknowledgement for Christians, in particular, needs to be accompanied by compassion, rooted in a recognition of ourselves and of God's image in the other. And this begins to make the point that racism at the end of the day is not a skin problem. It's ultimately a sin problem. For it's not the skin colour that causes racism, it's not even our cultural differences. It's actually a much more deeply rooted and sinister problem. It's largely to do with white supremacist or Eurocentric ideals which have shaped European philosophical, political and economic approaches for centuries. That Eurocentric or white supremacist ideology found its worst expression historically in slavery and in colonial domination of other peoples. And we've got to find a way of acknowledging the uglier side of British Empire. That's not to say it's the whole story, but it's certainly part of it. But that background also finds expression in unchallenged assumptions about black people. That we're overly engaged in criminality, that we're on the whole less intelligent. We're all athletic, sassy or potentially aggressive, always late, more likely to be unemployed. That knife crime is predominantly a black thing, that we're taking your jobs. There's an ugly history that has to be acknowledged. A painful history which means that racism is never experienced simply as a current problem. Instead, it's experienced as what it is, a learned behaviour inculcated over centuries. 
I come to this conversation without a background of personal experiences of overt racism. No one's ever called me the N-word or subjected me to other racist abuse in my hearing. I've never been overlooked for a role because I'm black as far as I know. I've not been harassed by the police nor followed around a shop because I look like a potential shoplifter. I've never been confused with the cleaner or mistaken for the taxi driver rather than the client. So I don't bring a particularly personal axe to grind to this conversation. But for many black people I know these experiences are far more frequent than you might imagine. Assumptions about white superiority or supremacy have been deeply inscribed in our culture, not only in Europe, but everywhere they colonized. And we are still unlearning them. So where do we go from here? Well, that's a really significant question, and there are no easy answers. But I can tell you this, that racism is not something for which black people should be expected to have an answer. As a man, I wouldn't dream of asking women victims of sexual violence to tell me how to avoid similar situations of violence happening to them in the future. Racism is not primarily a black problem. That's not to suggest that black people can't be racist. I think that's nonsense. Of course black people can be racist, and some of us are. Nonetheless, in this country, where less than 13% of the population comes from black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds, Racism is not primarily a black problem. It's primarily a white problem. And by the way, there is no other side to racism. I had a conversation about Black Lives Matter the other day when someone said to me, but there's another side. There can be no other side when the issue is racism. Sure, if we're having a political discussion, we can talk about another side. If we're debating economics or philosophy, of course there can be another side. If we're having a conversation about anything where there might be a range of acceptable though competing views, sure, there can be another side. But racism does not fall within a range of acceptable views. Racism is unacceptable, full stop. There is no other side. At this point in history, when systemic racism has been unmasked, it's no longer enough simply to be non-racist. We all need to be anti-racist if we're going to make the necessary changes to our society. And I find it particularly disturbing that the church, which should be at the vanguard of the struggle, we are in fact one of the quieter voices in public discourse condemning racism and racial injustice. Because for us, Racism is not only socially unacceptable, it's morally unacceptable because it is sin, unacceptable to God. So where do we go from here? I honestly don't know. But I do know that if we're gonna find a way forward, we're going to need to have the long overdue conversations like these about race. To name some of the elephants in the room, to acknowledge our painful past, to hold each other to account under God. And we, people of color, need you to care about these issues and to translate that caring into action. So please, let's have this long overdue conversation about racism.